Welcome. Tonight we're going to be talking about the cardiovascular test that can save your life. I'm Dr. Michael Twyman, a board-certified cardiologist who focuses on heart attack and stroke prevention. My practice of polycardiology was launched in 2019 for that sole purpose. We're located in St. Louis, Missouri, and we're treating patients all over the country and now all over the world. So tonight, for those that are new to my uh, world, welcome. Uh, we're going to be chatting about the tests that I do in my practice and recommend patients consider getting done to know what their true cardiovascular risks are. So there'll be an accompanying uh, post after this that lists these tests, so don't feel like you gotta take notes. Um, but you know, doing a traditional cholesterol panel, which we talked about last week on lipids 101, ApoB, which you really need to know, an EKG, which is an electrical tracing of your heart, and a stress EKG or stress treadmill test is not enough to tell you if you're at risk of a heart attack or stroke. There's more definitive tests that really will tell you what's going on in the arteries. So I used to use an analogy, test don't guess, but maybe I'm gonna start using, you know, um, <clears throat> a different analogy where it's more of a, you know, don't stress the test. Um, so the tests that you need to consider getting done fall into three buckets. So I usually start with, you know, what drives plaque? First, it's gonna be endothelial dysfunction. That's the story of nitric oxide at the artery layer called the endothelium and sitting on top of that endothelial glycocalyx. After the endothelium has been damaged, the artery wall, the intima, will start to swell due to the inflammation. That can be measured with a certain ultrasound. And then if the process is allowed to continue to go on, the immune system and the lipoproteins, which are getting retained in the artery wall, will develop a fatty streak in the plaque. Soft plaque will initially form, the body will try to take care of it, eventually scarring it down and calcifying it. <coughs> So your artery is not like a sewer pipe that just fills up with uh, sludge and then, then you have a heart attack. It's more that the artery wall has been damaged, there's an immune response, and it's low and slow growing for many years in many people. Unfortunately, half the time people have a heart attack, they had no symptoms before they had that heart attack. And up to 50% of heart attacks are fatal, the initial one. Um, so you want to look at this years before you have your first symptom. So if you're already having chest pain, shortness of breath, exercise intolerance. Now, a traditional stress test is good at trying to uncover if it's a cardiovascular cause for those symptoms, but you may already have a 70% blockage in one of your arteries by that stage. So we want to find your way before that. So let's go way back upstream. It's endothelial dysfunction. So how do you test the endothelium? So there are blood tests that can do that, but that's not what we're going to chat about tonight. We're going to talk about the, the testing that you can do either at home or in an office that has this type of gear. So the home kit, typically it's gonna be using salivary nitric oxide strips. You know, company probably doesn't show very well, but human with two ends makes test strips. They're kind of like litmus paper. You put saliva on it. If it's white, you're not making very much salivary nitric oxide. If it's dark red, you're making good salivary nitric oxide. Likely to have elastic, healthy arteries. The other thing that can be done is just checking your blood pressure, checking your break of blood pressure. Ideally, your break your blood pressure should be 120 or 80 or less. If it's not, you may have markers of endothelial dysfunction. In my office, I have a device called the ATCOR, A-T-C-O-R. Measures your brachial blood pressure. We always check in both sides because some people have a difference in their blood pressure of 20 points or more, uh, and that can indicate that there's a blockage in the subclavian artery. If you have a blockage in your artery going to your arm, you're gonna get a falsely low blood pressure in that arm. So you always wanna check your blood pressure in the arm that's highest. If you have a blockage in your subclavian artery, you may have a blockage in your coronary artery or carotid artery. So at least, at least the first time you meet somebody, check it in both arms. But our ACCOR device will actually measure your central atrial blood pressure. That's the blood pressure as it comes out of your heart, goes down your heart arteries, called your coronary arteries, goes up your carotid arteries to your brain, goes to your kidneys. That's the true driving pressure that increases risk. And when I was an invasive cardiologist, we used to feed sheaths up your arteries in your wrist or in your leg and we would measure the pressures in your aorta. And we push the catheter into your heart and measure the pressures inside the heart. And so nobody's signing up for me to put needles in them when they come to my office. This ACCOR device non-invasively measures it. How does it do it? There's a blood pressure cuff on your arm. When, after it takes the brachial pressure, it will basically listen for an echo of the previous uh, heartbeat. So when the blood is ejected from the left ventricle, it goes in your aorta, it goes down to your legs, it's gonna hit that bifurcation point where the iliac arteries are. And much like splashing water at a wall and the water comes back at you, that speed that the blood, basically reflection wave comes back to your arm can be measured with this ACCOR device. And it will calculate 
what your saturated blood pressure is based off that speed. So that's the device we use in our office with our patients every time they see us. The other test that we will use in the office is called the max pulse. It's pulse wave velocity. Um, there is a home unit essentially from a company called uh, Mobi, M-O-B-V-O-I. I can't fully uh, um, recommend them at this point. I've been a little bit disappointed by some of their uh, ability to get consistent readings, but if you ever see me you know, posting things on vascular age, uh, this is one of those devices that can show it. Uh, today I did this morning, I was uh, 20 to 30 years old, which made me happy since I'm not that old anymore. I'm hopefully uh, um, gonna try to stay that uh, age uh, vascularized. That was Thomas Sintham saying, you know, a man is as old as his arteries. So I'll take 20 to 30 all day long. But it has a PPG, uh, plasma photo photography uh, sensor on the side of this little watch. Works similar to the way that our Max Pulse device is, but you, know, you put your finger over it, there's a little green light. So instead of measuring the oxygen in your fingers, it's measuring the elasticity of the arteries and it's looking how well they kind of expand and contract. If you have healthy arteries, it should be like an accordion that should expand and contract very quickly. If you have sick arteries, it's like a lead pipe and the arteries are then going to be more likely to have to have significant endothelial dysfunction because if they're stiff, they can't relax very well. The, the smooth muscle in the artery doesn't have the nitric oxide that causes it to dilate. So the Max Pulse has seven different levels. Type one and two are normal. Six, seven are very bad. Everything else is kind of gray zone. And it's definitely changeable by your nutrition, your exercise. You know, there's different supplements, there's different medications that can also improve that elasticity. The other test that can be used to look at your endothelial function is a test called the endopath. It's a non-invasive 15 minute test that basically gives you a percentage of how much nitric oxide your arteries can release when they've been stressed. It's like a stress test for your brachial artery. Test is performed in a fasted state. You come in, you lay down, there's a five minute warm-up period, there's finger probes that measure that elasticity in your fingers essentially, and it looks like a little seismograph on the screen. After five minutes are done and there's kind of been a warm-up period, a blood pressure cuff is pumped up over your brachial blood pressure, and you have like a flat line in that one hand because no blood is coming down your hand. Not dangerous, but you're likely to get that pins and needles sensation in your hand. And after the five minutes are up, you open up the blood pressure cuff, the blood rushes back down into the hand. So you get something known as reactive hyperemia. So as the blood rushes back down into the hand, it essentially tickles the endothelial glycocalyx, which is the gel coat lining the arteries. That shear stress of that blood coming back will be transduced to the endothelium that lies below that. Nitric oxide is going to be released due to that stressor. The nitric oxide will cause the artery wall, the smooth muscle in the artery wall to relax and the flow improves. You can measure the percentage of how much it will dilate on this test. Normally, if it's less than 1.68, you have endothelial dysfunction. Over 2.1 is normal, optimal is three or four. What does that mean? 1.68 means that the artery only dilated 68%. Your artery should at least double in size when you have reactive hyperemia, but ideally triple the quadruple in size. So that's been validated uh, against invasive um, acetylcholine challenges in the cath lab where they put wires on the artery and give you certain medicines to constrict the arteries and then they look at the reactive hyperemia. So it's a good non-invasive test to tell you, do you truly have healthy arteries? So that's where you get tested way before you actually have plaque. Who should do these tests? You know, essentially anybody over the age of 18 should potentially consider those tests. The other time I'm gonna start recommending, typically they're gonna be started probably in your 30s. That's when you're starting to look for soft plaque. The test that I typically recommend for that is called a carotid intimal medial thickness test, or CIMT for short. It's an ultrasound of the artery on the side of your neck. That artery uh, gives good windows. It's easily acceptable, uh, accessible. It does not require radiation to get those pictures. And it's about 80% correlated to what's going on in your heart arteries, your coronary arteries as well. So you can sometimes get missed some things, but if you see it here, it's very likely it's gonna be in the coronary arteries as well. That test will look at the intimal thickness, that layer, the thicker it is, the more inflammation in the artery. That's the part of the test that gives you your vascular age. If your vascular age is higher than your biological age, you got a problem and you gotta figure out what's driving that. That's what the blood work will help you figure it out. But if there's soft plaque present, is it, you know, mixed where you got a thick cap over it or is it more um, thin capped those plaques are more likely to rupture and cause strokes um, but if you can regress the plaque in the carotid artery very likely the plaque regresses in the coronary artery as well 
So typically, you know, over the age of 30, could consider that test if you have a high enough risk factors, either from labs or family history. But most people I'm speaking to, these are people who generally can be over the age of 40, maybe 45 years old, and they don't want to end up like their parents. You know, they're generally pretty healthy otherwise. You know, they exercise, they try to watch what they eat, they're trying to manage their stress, they're trying to sleep well, and they want to know, like, where do they truly stand? The best test for those people is generally going to be a CT coronary calcium score or CAC score. It's about $100 um, to look at is there any calcium in the walls of your artery. I tell people it's like a mammogram for the heart. Calcium is supposed to be in your bones, it's supposed to be in your teeth, it's not supposed to be in your heart arteries. If it's in your heart arteries, in case that you've had some break into your heart arteries and your body's trying to dam heal up that damage by scarring it down. Calcium, for the most part, is generally not dangerous. It's usually a stabilizing factor. But if this little concrete you know, uh, plaque builds up to a big enough degree where it obstructs flow, you may have angina when you exercise. You know, typically, it's going to be more stable angina. It'll stop when you stop doing that activity. And you know, yes, stents can move, you know, open that up at times, but you haven't really fixed why you got that plaque in the first place. But the big concern is when the calcium is present, there's always also going to be soft plaque present that hasn't yet calcified. And it's the soft plaque that tends to rupture and cause heart attacks. So, and somebody who's about you know, 40 years old, your calcium score test should be zero. If it's not, you have a major you know, red flag that you're at very high risk at that age. You know, if you're 80 years old on the converse and your score is zero, then whatever you've been doing is working for you. Probably shouldn't be more aggressive with your medications because whatever you did worked already. But it's that gray zone in between that. Now, a calcium score that's over 400 would be considered high risk. Somebody score over 1,000, very high risk. My record right now, somebody has a score over 7,000. Still work up in progress for this person, but my last high score, the gentleman's score is over 3,500. He unfortunately ended up with you know, multi-vessel bypass surgery under the age of 50. And he didn't have a lot of symptoms before he got that scan. So it was very fortunate that we picked it up at that stage before he had an event. So that's looking more at the hard plaque, and it will infer that there's soft plaque present as well. Now for the right population, there's a new test, a relatively new test that I've been using for the past year called the CLEARLY CCTA, CT coronary angiogram. So the CT coronary angiogram is a little more involved in the calcium score test. There's more radiation, there's more cost, there's more prep for it. Um, I've done previous talks on this test. If you want to know more details of it, you can go to my website. It's drtwyman.com slash clearly, and that's spelled C-L-E-E-R-L-Y. I go through the, uh, my experience of you know, prepping for the test and then also how to interpret a report. But the Clearly scan uses AI machine learning uh, to do basically a second opinion of what a radiologist is seeing. Um, with the CT angiogram. The CT angiogram is putting contrast through an IV to uh, fill up the lumen of the blood vessels so you can assess if there's any plaque in the walls of the artery. But what that clearly does that no other technology does at this time, uh, that's non-invasive, it will give you a total plaque volume. So if there's calcium, it's gonna see it. It'll tell you how much millimeters cubed of total plaque there is, but it's gonna break it down into what is calcified, which generally is gonna be more stable what is soft, which potentially can be a problem, and then what is the very low density uh, plaque. That's the plaque that's more likely necrotic, essentially on fire plaque, and maybe more prone to plaque rupture. So you really wanna be very aggressive if you see somebody with uh, a lot of very low density soft plaque. Now, if it's just soft plaque, a couple things that can happen. The plaque can calcify. Statins will tend to calcify those soft plaques, stabilizes it. That's one of the, uh, the ways, mechanism of action that statins work. The salt plaque can potentially regress, and I've definitely seen this on other testing. Um, there's you know, a cocktail of supplements and medications that have been shown to get plaque to regress. That would be the best case. What you don't want to see is the salt plaque turning more necrotic. So you can assess that with some of the other blood tests and the other non-invasive tests to say, is it likely that that one is uh, getting worse? Because it clearly involves more radiation, more cost. It's not a test that you can do every year. It's maybe you know, every three to five years you may consider that type of test. So that's what I'm going to share with you guys tonight are what are the best tests at looking at your cardiovascular health. In summary, you know, first it's endothelial health. It's going to be nitric oxide testing, blood pressure, both central and brachial blood pressure. We have a device in our office called the ACCOR. You can look at something called your pulse wave velocity with a max pulse device. At this point, I'm not yet recommending the Mobi watch. It's interesting, but I don't think it's accurate enough yet that I can recommend everybody consider using it but it gives you an arterial age if you're into that type of stuff. The 
Indopet is the gold standard on invasive test of telling you the percentage of nitric oxide your arteries can release. So that's the endothelial side of things. The soft plaque, that's mainly going to be the carotid intimal medial thickness, or ultrasound to the artery on the side of your neck, gives you a vascular age, gives you how much soft plaque is present. If there's hard plaque, you can also assess that. But that's the window that you can see easily with no radiation. It's about 80% correlated with what's going on with the coronary artery. If the plaque is getting better in your carotid, it's very likely getting better in your coronary artery as well. And then to look at the more hard plaques, um, that's going to be the CT coronary calcium score. And the clearly scan, we'll look at both soft plaque, but I wouldn't order the test just to look at the soft plaque initially. Um, personally, I have to have enough risk factor for where I kind of pull the trigger for that one. But if you, you know, are going to order the clearly, you're going to get the hard plaque, the soft plaque, and then the very low density uh, plaque. So that's what I wanted to share with you guys tonight. Two things I wanted to um, let you guys know about. One, uh, our office here in St. Louis, we have a Toys for Tots fundraiser going on right now. If you're local to St. Louis and bring in a toy, uh, we're gonna give you a session on our photobiomodulation device. We have the EMR Tech Firehawk. It's eight foot tall, four foot wide, and it's the beast. Uh, if you want all your mitochondria charged up at once, you know, just uh, send me a message, call the office, 314-635-9028. You can also text the office, uh, let Cassidy know, and we'll get you happily set up to get one of the uh, mitochondria charge up sessions with our big red light. Second thing I want to share tonight is that, you know, I have a YouTube channel. I don't heavily promote it on this panel, um, but, you know, I'm going to be making some more long form videos that'll go there. I can actually pull up slide decks, you know, keynote presentations, review labs, review imaging. I'll be doing some show and tells of these type of devices that I've talked about tonight. All that content is going to be stored on my YouTube channel. I'll leave the link in the description for this video, but it's just YouTube dot com slash at Dr. Twyman, spelled exactly like my name is up here. Um, so be on the lookout for that. I'm going to be dropping the first episode in November. It's going to be a long form content. It's going to be talking about in the field dysfunction. And then I'll start doing some show and tells of the devices I chatted about here tonight. Um, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be down in Cancun doing my sun run. Um, have some people coming down there to join me to learn how to optimize their sun, sand, and sea to optimize their survival. Uh, I'll be sharing a lot of content that week, so stay tuned for that. That's going to be uh, in the first part of December. Next Monday, 6 p.m. Central Time, I'll be doing another chat about photobiomodulation. Uh, most likely it's going to be on musculoskeletal uh, uh, issues because that's the main use for it. So uh, I'll you know, bring out some of my red light toys, do a little bit of show tell on this for you guys to show you how you can use red light therapy for musculoskeletal injuries or peak performance. You know, you can use this stuff before you exercise. So I want to thank you guys for your time and attention tonight. If there's any questions, I'll try to answer them. Otherwise, I'll let you go on your way tonight. Somebody's asking, is it okay to supplement with nitric oxide upon nabivalol? I can't answer one-on-one -on -one medical questions in this type of forum. I would have to know what else you're on and what your blood pressure is. But the answer is, it's possible that it may be okay, but um, I'd have to know a little bit more information before um, giving that kind of recommendation. All right, guys. Well, I thank you for your time and attention. I hope you guys have a great week. Happy Thanksgiving, and I'll see you next Monday, 6 p.m. Central Time.